me start off by saying kwaba, which means welcome in my mother's tongue. And I thought it'd be a great idea for us to share black history from a different perspective. An encouragement of my communications department, where are they? They're all hiding somewhere. Um, we were talking about Black History Month, and usually when you have the conversations, the typical things that happen, and I go, well, you know, have you ever thought about this way? Have you, can we consider it this way? And we said, you know what, let's start a conversation so we can have an inclusive conversation, but integrate it and have people have different perspectives around it. And they seemed to like my perspective around it, and I said, okay, well, I can do some conversations ar around that. And so tonight I've got uh, about 80 different slides I'm good. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'll try to condense it down because, you know, I, I can keep talking at times so it can be really succinct. Um, but really what I wanted to do is to prompt um, some thinking, right? Some metacognitive analysis around black history and how it connects to the world. And so that's how I'm going to kind of uh, share my thoughts. And hopefully that'll resonate with you a little bit and you can go back to your own jurisdictions whatever you do, and, and have uh, continued conversations, and it'll permeate through our, um, our district and our community as well. I want to start by sharing this with you from the Maasai. Have people heard of the Maasai tribe? Right? They're in the East Africa. So, Habari za Watutu. That means, how are the children? This is how they greet people. When you come into the community, you don't say, how are you doing, right? You say, how are the children, right? So because the children are the barometer of how well your community is doing, right? I thought it would be a good connection for us because that's what we're doing, right? We're trying to cultivate our children that represent our greater community. I think they got it right. They've been doing that for centuries. You know, you come travel from far, you say, habari za watutu, how are the children? And that gives you... Um, a barometer of how things are going. Okay. So if any of you have uh, seen my uh, little blog, uh, newsletter, a little bit about the um, black history, and one of the conversations we're having is, okay, how do we engender our kids to learn about uh, black history, but also to start writing their own history? Because I'm very much a believer in empowering yourself to develop your own history. There's history, and you need to be uh, cognizant of that in order to not repeat the negative things, but also to move forward. And also, I know for me, when I was uh, a young person, black history meant, let's talk about slavery, right? And that wasn't fun. I mean, that was good stuff to know, but I remember being in class, and sometimes I'd be in classes where I'd be one or two um, a person of color, and they'd say, they'd be reading something, and they'd say, what do you think about that? How do you feel about that, right? I'd be like, how do I feel about it? I mean, like, it's slavery. People, you know, I don't feel very good about it, right? And uh, I actually got into a uh, conflict with one of my friends. He was about six years old. Um, I, I, was, I was living in New York at the time. I was in first grade. And we were talking about, I think Roots had just come out. Remember Roots? Right? So people were... Uh, in that generation, we're getting a consciousness. I know back in the 60s and 70s, people were kind of conscious of, you know, Africa and, and things like that. And so people were talking about roots and the history of African Americans here and things like that. And we were having a conversation. And this is my very good friend. And um, he was saying something about, he's like, oh, slaves. And, you know, your people were slaves. And I go, well, because I'm African. My family's from Ghana. And we had just, I go, Oh, no, I didn't come over in a, in, a, in a boat. I came over in a plane, right? And he didn't understand that. And so we were getting desired. I was trying to explain to him there's different types of black people, right? We're all connected, but there's different and different regionally. And he didn't understand it. We got into a big fight about it and stuff. He didn't talk to me for days and everything. And then he came back later because I think his parents had a conversation with him and kind of explained. And so at that early age, I started thinking, huh, okay, there's more to this. And people see different things and don't understand the connections or the real histories that are unfolded. So I said, okay, let's look at our own kids. And um, you can see this lovely cutie patootie here, Abrila. She is one of our pre-K students. And she's on the face of our uh, slide deck. And uh, I thought she just represents 
such a shining example of what we want to be, right? You can see all the hope in your eyes and the excitement to be in school, right? That was a moment in time that was captured, right? And she represents the diaspora, for sure. And then you see the young man next to her, his story. That's me, about the same age. And that picture was taken in Accra, Ghana. I had my double-breasted suit on. <laughs> so I think I still have it, but I can't fit into it. I was going to try to wear it, but I can't fit into it. If we're about the same story. So I thought about the parallel stories. We all have our own stories. Everybody here has their stories, right? And where does your story start? But more importantly, where are you going to take your story? Right? So this month is a good opportunity to kind of do the step back, reflect. But then hopefully that should engender you and empower you to think about the successes of the past to move you um, really forward. So I'm going to try to articulate some of the um, really, I think, igniting and powerful things that are happening globally around black history. I'm not going to talk too much about slavery because I think we've talked a lot about that and there is a place for that. But I'm going to take this time to talk more about before enslavement because there is a history there's a black history way before thousands of years, and we don't spend a lot of time about that. You know, I remember when I first started studying ancient history, I learned about the Greek mythology and the Roman Empire and things like that. Um, but you don't spend a lot of time in North America talking about the other histories, and that's what we're striving to become inclusive. So I thought I'm going to do my part and try to share, um, at least from my perspective. Once again, it is my perspective. So everything I say is right. <laughs> All right, so let's start off with uh, the father of uh, Black History Month is uh, Carter G. Woodson. And I, I know most of you know this, but I thought this would be a good place to start just to have a... History officially marks Black History Month in the U.S. It is one of the nation's oldest organized history celebrations, which highlights African-American achievements and their role in U.S. history. It was started by Carter G. Woodson, known as the father of Black History Woodson noticed that African Americans and their achievements were excluded from books and schools in the early 1900s. The son of three Virginia slaves, he earned a PhD in history from Harvard and came up with the idea of Negro history to encourage black Americans to know more about their own history. In 1915, Woodson founded what is known today as the Association for the Study of African American Life and History to promote black history. Wilson chose February for Negro history because it coincided with the birthdays of President Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, who escaped slavery and became a social activist. As celebrations were ongoing, Woodson promoted the week as a time to focus on African American history. The first Negro History Week was announced in February 1926. Negro History Week was widely successful, but Woodson felt more was needed. In the late 1960s, the Civil Rights and Black Power movement advocated for an official shift from Black History Week to Black History Month. In 1976, President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month, urging Americans to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout their history. Each year, the theme for Black History Month is chosen by ASALH. This year's theme is Black Health and Wellness which will also examine how the U.S. healthcare system has often underserved the black community. Okay, I think I know why that wasn't working, Julian. That was uh, a different sort of version of the video. All right. So there you go. So that was a quick synopsis. And one of the things in that the video, the other video that I that had had an extended piece, it talks about today. And one of the initiatives, um, Black History Month this year, is around healthcare of um, African Americans and, and Black peoples in America. You know, coming out of the pandemic, a lot of things were illuminated in terms of the needs and things like that. So I thought that was a good theme around the healthcare piece. Um, to be talking about and thinking about. Did anybody see anything in there that kind of you saw the video and you reminded yourself, oh, yeah, that's right, or you learned something different that you didn't know before. Anyone? <coughs> Everybody knew everything? Okay. All right.
Just, right, because yeah. of the uh, those two things, right? Yeah. And I didn't know that. You didn't know that? Didn't know there you go. Miss Venus, you're shaking your head? No, I was, I was agreeing. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, because that's often the thing. Like, oh, well, we got the shortest month, you know. I say it too, and I know, but it's, just for, it's fun to say, right? <laughs> right? Um, but those are the facts, right, in terms of why it was it's just. Anybody else before we move on? No? Okay. Let me. So. One of the things I wanted to kind of uh, emphasize is that black history is African-American history. It's world history, right? And one of the things, you know, Carter G. Woodson started this education from the week to a month. And you would not believe across the world they celebrate Black History Month because of African-Americans, right? And everyone's kind of taking a different spin now, right? They all started following the exact same scripts that we have here, but now different countries are doing their own little bits and also starting to discover, oh my goodness, these are the contributions of black people from diaspora in our country, and acknowledging that, going way back and also in contemporary times. So I find that fascinating because then when I travel around the world, I look for little pieces like that and you see the evidence of it and you also see the historical pieces and I go, we're never talking about those connections, right? I remember when I was a kid, every Black History Month, we did Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, you know, it was this, okay, all right, now, okay. That, now what, there are other things that we've contributed in um, this society, right? So let's take this journey. I talked about uh, Black history around the world. And uh, in Japan, they do it, of course, in the US. In Britain, Brazil, in Canada, they all have uh, Black History Month, and they have their little twist on it as well. They all start the same the same way as uh, we do it here, but they now countries are starting to now take their own and examine their own uh, practices, and also having a social justice bent on it. Right? How are we treating people of color in our country based on that? And um, I think it's it's fabulous, and we need to educate our kids. I always think, okay, I want to educate Abrila to go rocket in the world. Not just Kansas City, not just Missouri, not just the U.S., but the world. Because that's where we're going, right? We're global, right? And I know people who, on their laptop, they work overseas, right? They're back and forth here and there. And um, that's where we got to prepare our students for it and to be educated. So in England... Um, they have the same sort of Black History Month and cover some of the same topics, but they've now kind of shifted. And their focus is around um, Caribbean community, because that's a large population there. That's why that flag there, it's a half flag, kind of Jamaican flag, Caribbean colors, and the British flag. And so they talk a lot about the contributions of the Caribbean um, in Britain, because of course, the Caribbean um, islands are colonies were ruled under Britain, and they had there's lots of history that goes back in terms of the influence of people there and where they've, they've come and gone. One of the things I would talk about is that they called the, uh, the uh, Windrush group. So back in 1940, uh, His Majesty's ship would carry uh, immigrants from the Caribbean to Britain. And that's been going on since till like the 80s. The ship would bring you know, because they're part of the, the colonies, and they would come and they would live in Britain. And so what happened to that first group is, of course, they felt a lot of discrimination. Um, they ended up fighting in the wars, World War II. There were soldiers in the war. So now they look back at that history and the contributions they helped to build that country in the modern era, up to contemporary times in terms of all the different uh, pieces they're going through. Anybody go see the Bob Marley movie yet? So, see it? Yeah. So you can see, so, you know, Jamaica is a, is a British colony, and there's lots of uh, contact there. Um, I, any people have Irish uh, descendancy in their history? Yep. Okay, yep. Probably have a lot. You know, the Irish, are like, if you, if you did the ancestry, 
Um, <laughs> the Irish, almost, I think about 70% of people have something. They've been all over, right? If you're in North America, anyways, I should say, right? Um, you heard the term Black Irish? Yeah, anybody know what that term means? Black Irish, okay. So Black Irish, you, you see that. And uh, there's, there's been all kinds of jokes and things like that that happen. But the Black Irish is not really about directly connected to, like, uh, black people. It's about the Spanish Armada that crashed on the coast of Ireland. And they all escaped to get on the island of Ireland. And they lived. And, of course, they ended up mixing into the community. And so you go to Ireland and you have people who have dark hair and dark eyes, and they call them Black Irish, right? So there's Spaniards that's mixed into it, right? So it's not really black. But then, okay, in my studies of history, I go, oh, okay, but if you look back before that, the Spaniards, you go back to the Iberian Peninsula, back to 700 BC, they had ruled over the Spanish area. And so they had people in North America, in North Africa, the Moors, you heard of the Moors, right? North Africa had rule of the Iberian area, which was Spain and Portugal. So they were mixed. So already those, the Spaniards, who were a little bit more darker skinned already mixed with people who have African descendancy. Right? And so when they come over and they say black Irish, so actually, they're actually accurate, because there could be some tracing all the way back. Right? And then um, looked at Germany. Uh, Germany uh, is a country that have been known for some horrific discriminatory practices of people, right? Because we know about the Holocaust in the world, and they're very, uh, they, were very, they were very segregationist, right? And in recent times, they did um, a census called the Afro Census, right, which dug into um, the treatment of people of color, and in particular, people of African descent, right? And they found that there was levels of discrimination, and that's prompted some change Right? So their Black History Month is about social justice and treating people fairly around that. Right? And even though I'm um, African descent and my family is from Ghana, West Africa, did I tell you that? Yeah. Um, I was born in Germany. Right? So I have a connection to, uh, to Germany as well, too. Right? Uh, then we get to uh, France. Okay. So France, uh, people say, oh, are there any black people in France? Do they do black history? All these countries and other countries, they actually uh, recognize uh, Black History Month in, anyone know? What month? Take a guess. That's a really good guess. <laughs> but it's inaccurate. They do October. Okay? And why do you October? They do October because... October is the month that, if you look at many African countries that gained their independence, it happened to be in around October, right? Around October is when it happened. So that's when um, they decided to do it in October because um, in those countries, um, a lot of the black people are directly from Africa, right? As opposed to not, it's supposed to here, we have Afri well, African Americans are from Africa as well too, but there's a 300-year gap, 400-year gap in between that, right? So, so that's why theirs is in October, and ours is in February. We know why ours is in February now, right? And we know why they do theirs in October. Um, France. France. Are there any black people in France? Yeah? I think so? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I know he's... So. Oh, there are! <laughs> there he is. Right? There he is, the one black person in France. No, there's lots of black people. <laughs> so I was in France doing some discovery, and uh, there I am. You know about the uh, Harlem Renaissance and things like that, right? And so I had a chance to get a bistro. And I love crepes, so I had to um, eat some crepes. You know, I, I, I'm trying to find a way to find a connection that crepes is originally from Africa in some way, right? Because I love it so much. But, um, and then the Louvre. Um, Museum. I don't know if some of you might have been to the Louvre, but there's lots of historical uh, context there in terms of world history and also connecting back to the motherland as well. And of course, the Tower Eiffel, Eiffel Tower, right? And uh, the Olympics is in France this year, right? And uh, right now, um, 
the uh, I don't know if anybody's heard this. The Eiffel Towers has been has been shut down for the last three days. Anybody hear about that? Yeah, because the, the workers are on strike. <laughs> the workers are on strike, and France is known for uh, social justice and uprising, right? Back to Marie Antoinette and stuff where they fought against the uh, the monarchy and stuff like that. So they're known. So they're, I think they're going to hold more of a barrel because they get ready for the for the uh, Olympics, and then they're on strike. So they're painting the uh, Eiffel Tower and getting it prepared and things like that. But nevertheless, um, France has a great connection to uh, America for sure. So the French um, Harlem Renaissance um, had people that uh, were African Americans that went there. You know, a lot of military uh, were there during the wars, and they felt great. They were treated really well, and some of them stayed. And even some of the performers and things started going back, and they would be in France. You can see those young ladies over there, they're like post flappers. They're hanging out in France. They're African American women. And then Sidney Bachet, um, Louisiana, I believe he, he's a Creole. So you know Creoles, uh, they have a French. The Creoles are French descendancy. He's African American, and so he'd go there and perform, and and found uh, a connection um, with that. And of course, a lot of performers. Uh, went and you know you can read about the Harlem Renaissance and the French Harlem Renaissance. Of course, you've all probably heard about Josephine Baker, right? Josephine Baker, she was a, a performer, a singer, an artist, right? Um, African American that stayed in uh, in France and did a lot of work. One of the things that uh, I don't think is well known about Josephine Baker, and people tell me um, something about her uh, military service. Anybody know anything about that? Yeah, she was a spy. She was a spy. Yeah, when I heard that, I go, oh, she was so cool, right? She was a spy, right? And so she was passing information back and forth, and because she was a popular, uh, famous person, she could move in different spaces and pass information and things like that. So I got a whole new respect for her when I, when I first found that out. All right, so we moved to uh, the Scottish court. So we talked about the uh, history um, before... Uh, the transatlantic and enslavement, right? There's history that goes way back. Even in Scottish, in Scotland, there's, uh, from the 1500s, there's evidence of uh, people of African descent there, right? Um, Peter the Mooring, which is Peter the, the Moor, uh, this gentleman was a, a friend of um, King James. King James had given him money to travel to France and represent him and Form and carry information back and forth, so he was well respected. He could move around, and he had a family, and all kinds of uh, uh, intricate things that happened there. There's actually a book that's written by him by a Russian. Um, explains he's called him Peter the Great, and talks about you know some of his exped expedites and things like that. Um, so King James married Margaret Tudor. Right, Margaret Tudor is the daughter of Henry the Seventh. Anybody know the Tudor family? The Tudor family is the reigning empire right now in Britain, right? You know, Diana and Prince Charles, they're from the Tudor family. And you probably know more about Henry VIII, right? He's the one that chopped off all his, uh, his wives and things like that. But that's the connection there in terms of um, the Scottish piece. But Margaret had um, three women in her royal ritun which are advisors, women advisors, you know, women and lately, and they were um, African women, right? And um, so they're there, and they got to be in the court at the highest level with the queen, right? And mingle around and advise her and, and uh, share information. And, of course, they would have probably picked up the French language and the, and the Scottish, there's a Scottish, Scottish language, be able to... Uh, I mean, anybody seen the, uh, the uh, show Bridgerton? Okay, so that's not too far from Bridgerton, right? Because you're like, oh, okay. So there were uh, black queens running around talking gossip and making up stuff, right? So I had these shots here. Um, so there's a connection there. And um, so this is, this is Helen right here. Um, of course, her name, original name was not Helen. We don't know what her name was. It was, it was an African name, but she became, she became the first maiden. So they call her the Quintus Blach Maiden, 
right? So she was a high honor. She was serving of the most beautiful lady of the court, become the lady of the tournament, the Black Knight. King James, in 1507, competed in that tournament, right? And you've all seen on television in terms of the tournament. So this is, this is real history. Competed in that tournament, and he won her hand in that tournament. Um, so she was very well respected um, in her stature and some of the things that she did. And so she rose from being a handmaiden to being designated uh, the queen of the tournament. To the extent that people have written about her, written songs, written books, uh, William Dunbar wrote a poem of Anne of Blackmore, right? Because she was a Moor, right? And uh, that really immortalized her history. The only thing about what he wrote was it was a little discriminatory. <laughs> Even though she was considered the most beautiful, the way he wrote about her was the description was kind of a little bit in a negative way, right? But at the same time, it became, she became immortalized because she was, if you, if somebody wrote about you, especially in those times, it carried time, right? People could read it, they could research it, things like that. Um, and so here I am. Um, they were in the Edinburgh Castle, right? In Edinburgh, Scotland. And uh, I had a chance to actually go to the castle. Right? And it's still there today. Well structured. Right? There's me sneaking in. Right? I went in the front door though. And um, you know, the history there is so vast. You know, in North America we talk about um, things that are, you know, a couple hundred years old, that's really old, two hundred you got places that are, you know, thousands, you know, hundreds, hundreds, like way back. And the buildings are still standing. Right? And so you can really pick up a lot of history because it's been documented down, or there's things on the walls that tell you what happened, or there's statues and things like that. Um, but this is the type of history that I know I never received immediately when I was in classes with Mrs. McGillicuddy, when we were talking about black history, and connected to medieval times, because I love medieval times, right? I love medieval times. They give you a steak and a mug. And you can call the waitress a wench. You can, it's all, right? I would have soaked up the literature so much if they could have engaged in that. So I hope we are finding ways to engage our students into, um, think about the uh, young men, maybe women as well, too, who would enjoy learning about knights, right? And how that plays into, you know, courtesy and manner and also chivalry and honor, Um we could bring some of that honor to some students in terms of how they behave and perform, right? So here we are at Edinburgh, and uh, a little bit of history there for you. So we bring it back to Kansas City. Lots of history in Kansas City. Lots and lots of history in Kansas City. And um, there's all kinds of living history, and there's historical history, both far. Um, I'm not sure about the ancient history here. The ancient history goes back to the native peoples, right? Because of the native peoples that are here. We live in Missouri. That's a, that's a native uh, name. There are several uh, native tribes in this area, which would be the ancestry of this land. But in more recent times, um, uh, especially in Kansas City, African Americans, there are many significant people who made the city the way it is. And one of them is uh, Minnie Lee Crossway. She was one of the first... African-American social workers. We talked about health, right? So health has always been a concern for humans, period, and also for uh, African-American community. Think about it. If you didn't have a doctor to go to or get the supports you needed for your health, man, but people like that were out there um, leading the way, setting the groundwork, helping uh, people to find services and supports. And then you have Thomas Unthank, who's considered the father of uh, Negro hospitals here in um, Kansas City. So he established Negro hospitals. So, um, you know, they called them Negro at the time, right? Uh, black people could go to get hospitals and get serviced by uh, medical practitioners. Uh, so lots of history of people who have been able to uh, contribute to the city. And there's lots of local history um, here, right, in our area as well, too. 
right, that you can look up. And of course, I couldn't talk about Kansas City area without talking about Langston Hughes, right? Um, I mean, he's from the Renaissance uh, era, Harlem Renaissance, well-known writer. Um, and he talked about in his book, Dreams, hold fast to your dreams, for without them, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. He had words on top of words, right? Do it. And so let me bring you back to ancient history, but now I'm talking about on the continent um, of Africa and West Africa. Um, so I want to talk about the Mali Empire for a sec. So Mansa Musa reigned between 1312 to 1337. And how many people have heard of Mansa Musa before? Okay, yeah. So Mansa Musa, then you know that Mansa is not his first name, right? Mansa is a title. Musa is his name. It's like King Musa, Mansa Musa, right? Yao Obeng, you know, like that. <laughs> Um, so he was the ninth ruler in the Mali Empire. He's still known to this day as possibly being the richest man ever to have lived. Why? Because in the West Africa, they had lots of salt. The salt was traded worldwide. And they had gold. Well, they still do. Gold, and he had lots of it, and his, his empire conquered, and he had lots of gold. He traveled. He was a traveler. So he traded with Europeans, right, with um, Middle Easterns, North, North Africans, and he gave away money, gold, to his people. So he was a very giving leader, so he was able to build up a lot of support. So he's well known in the Mali Empire for helping during that period to kind of bring it up to his prominence. Um, but he's known as the richest man in the world. You were able to, the amount of gold he had, um, no one would have that much uh, nowadays, right? And if you could translate that. But that was in the Mali Empire. Right? So he traveled, and one of his travels, um, he traveled all the way to Timbuktu, right? You've heard of Timbuktu? I always loved Timbuktu. I've never been to Timbuktu. I'd like to go someday to Timbuktu, just because I can say I went to Timbuktu, right? Um, Timbuktu <clears throat> is a famous uh, spot, um, and it became famous, and it's been synonymous with um, voyages, because to get to Timbuktu, it's quite a trek, right? And so a lot of the European travelers, when they came, and explorers and things like that, and... Um, they tried to get to Timbuktu because it was a place for trade and stuff. Sometimes you could and sometimes you could. But if you got there, it was a challenging trip, right? You could be, you know, all kinds of things that happened along the way. So they became synonymous with difficult voyages. So when they said, it's like traveling to Timbuktu, that means you know you're going for a real trek. And that's how it got its prominence in terms of Timbuktu. But it was known for commerce and trade. But um, Musa... Um, with all his wealth, he traveled to uh, Timbuktu, made it there, and he contributed gold, dollars, to build a university, right? Build a university um, in the 1300s, early 1300s. So Harvard University is the first uh, university in the U.S., right? 1636. And... Timbuktu was 1300s, right? So sometimes when I hear, you know, people in education talking about um, people of African descent or black students, not really the culture of learning or things like that, it's been happening for centuries, right? There's empirical data there that shows us quite learning. Lots of scholars from all over would come there. To this day, there are still, what they do now is preserve scrolls and texts and things from previous um, scholars and things there. And so you can go there. People go there for research and things like that. Um, you look at the um, Sankor University, which is in that same area, which was uh, would predate um, the University of Timbuktu, was around uh, 1100. So think about that. 
1100s, a university thinking about, hey, we need a place of learning, right, um, back there. And then, of course, the oldest university in the world in, in Africa, um, it's in Africa, and the oldest university in the world is University of al Korakawin, which is in Morocco, 1859. So there's been a history, a history of acquiring knowledge and learning, right, that our students should learn about and understand that this is nothing new trying to learn. I bet they still had the same challenges back then with kids on iReady. Because <laughs> <laughs> humans don't change. But there's the, there's the history of learning that's happening and, and to this day still uh, continues. Um, you know, even when you talk about um, in that region in terms of learning, you know the... Um, Cockadeus, you know the cockadeus, you know the, the uh, health sign, the snakes with the thing, right? And that's the sign of, you know, they have found that symbol in caves in Egypt. Socrates went to Egypt to learn before he went back to Rome, right? He went there to be educated, right? There's lots of connections with history back to the motherland that hits globally. <clears throat> okay, so... Include our ancient history, and this is in the northern part of Africa. So we had the uh, Ghana Empire, right, 400 BC, and then we moved to the Mali Empire um, for several uh, centuries, and we talked about um, Musa, who was a well-known <coughs> Mansa that created a lot of things. And then we moved in that west region to the Gold Coast. <coughs> so Gold Coast is what Ghana is called now, and it was called the Gold Coast because when the uh, British and the Dutch came there, you just get off the ships and you find gold on the beaches and um, you can mine it, and so they said Gold Coast. And they named all the coasts based on what they could find. That made sense because those were trading ports. Before they started trading humans, they were trading minerals and resources and things like that. So you heard of the Ivory Coast, so guess what they found there? Ivory, right? So they would um, trade in, in things like that. So there's a lot of rich resources um, that could be used that were taken advantage of back in the days. But hopefully now, hopefully things are um, moving forward. I have an uncle who's actually, um, he just retired actually. Not too long. He's the head accountant for the Ghana Gold Coast Mining Company. So they mine, so that's, he's been doing that for 100 years, not 100 years. 30 years or something like that. So there's still gold there. It's still lots of rich minerals. So that's where... And of course, <coughs> Ghana became the Republic of Ghana <coughs> yeah, on the 6th of March, 1957. And they gained their independence from the British, right? And Kwame Nkrumah was the uh, first uh, president who um, brought liberation. And um, they, have their found, they have the founding fathers as well, too. And the money does about five or six... Um, uh, gentleman on there, and actually Nkrumah's um, grandson or something was is in politics now, and so that's that's quite a legacy in terms of um, him being there. And <clears throat> so that brings you full circle, and let me. <clears throat> so one of the things I wanted to make sure to mention is often when we talk about history. We forget the her story, right? Because there's lots of women who have made a difference throughout history. And in Ghana, one of the uh, women who's well known is Ya Santwa. Um, she's not only great because she has the same name as me. Um, we both have the same name. Mine spelled different because I'm a male. <clears throat> but um, she fought the British. Um, and won, right? Think about that. And she's known for giving an inspiring speech to the Ashantis to rise up and fight. And they fought. They eventually captured her, put her in exile. Eventually she got out. <clears throat> but she was a, a well-known um, historical figure and a woman of courage that's still spoken about today. In, term, in terms of uh, doing that. And they had, and think about it, she was the general. She was leading the men, everybody, 
right? And she could inspire people to move forward, even though he had these invaders who had all these equipment and things, they were able to overcome. <clears throat> and they have a battle cry that they use, the Ashantis. You've heard of the Ashanti tribes, right? <clears throat> the Ashantis are probably one of the well-known uh, tribes in, <clears throat> in Ghana because of the cultural pieces and um, just being connected to a lot of different things around the world. And <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> But there are multiple tribes and dialects, like many dialects. If within one language, it could be multiple dialects. You can go from one village over here and have a slight dialect different. But the Ashantes um, are well known, and my mother would say that they're the best tribe, right? Why? Because. We were Shanti's, right? So they were always, they were always saying, oh, yeah, the best. And um, they have a battle cry, which they still use today. They say, Ashanti, koto, koto, koto. If you go to soccer games, you see them screaming it after the games they win. And so that's what Ya Santwa would inspire people and uh, be able to uh, fight. So lots of uh, respect for women and courage. And actually, in the Ashanti culture, um, inheritance is done through uh, matriarchal line, right? Patriarchal here, right? You hear it from your father. The Shantis, you hear it from your mother's side, right? So women are at a different place. And I'll tell you a quick story because I got a few minutes. Um, how that came about was there was a chief way back in the ancient times, and they were warring, right? Humans are always warring, right? You're always fighting over land and trying to get water or food or whatever. They were warring. And they got to a point where they had a battle they had to go, and this would be the battle to end all battles, right? Needed to win this battle. Otherwise, his people would lose, and they probably would be enslaved, right? Because, you know, of course, you know, the slavery existed way before the transatlantic. Humans have had slavery for thousands of years, right? Um, so this chief went to uh, a fetish priest, Right? A fetish priest is a, it's a type of priest, right? We probably would say, like, you know, voodoo or something like that, but they're called fetish priests. They're still there. They still have people who practice that religion, the fetish religion, and went to him and told him, hey, I have this battle. I want to win. I have to win for my people. What do I need to do in order to, to win this battle? And uh, the priest um, thought for a minute, pondered, and he said, I can ensure your win, but you have to make a sacrifice of blood. Which meant you had to sacrifice somebody, like spill blood, of your own blood. Somebody in his family, blood, that has to be sacrificed. So he thought about it, he's like, ooh, I'm going to do this, right? It's going to be tough. And it had to be someone of virtue, right? So children are. Right? So he thought, oh, okay. So he fortunately had multiple wives because he could do that. And he went to his first wife and he said, I went to the priest. We've got this big battle coming up. We have to win for our people. Please give me your child so we can sacrifice and um, win this war. And the wife responded, hell no. <laughs> right? So he was like, no, okay. So then he went to the second wife. Um, same thing, told her, okay, got this battle coming up. I went to the priest. The priest said, I have to sacrifice my own blood. Please give me your child so I can sacrifice and we can win. And the second wife said, hell, hell no. <laughs> right? Then he went on to his third wife. And then at that point, he had, he had a loss. He said, what am I going to do? And he was just, just thinking what he could do. And his sister came in and said, you know, brother, what is, what, is, what is bothering you? What is wrong? He said, I have this problem. I have to win this challenge. I went to the fetish priest. He told me 
how I could win this um, this battle. But my wives will not, you know, give me their children to sacrifice to spill the blood in order to do this. So the sister said, "Well, I love our people and I love you. I will sacrifice my child for the greater good of the community." So she gave up her child, and the child was sacrificed. They went on to the battle. He won. He was victorious. He was victorious. And so when he came back, he said, as of this day, any inheritance that is left from a man must go to his sister's children. So then that started the matriarchal lineage of inheritance from your mother's side as opposed to what we're used to, the father's side, right? And uh, nowadays, um, people still practice it um, in, in, in some sense. But they often go to what's called a, um, a lawyer, you know? <laughs> and write up a, an agreement, uh, agreement and stuff like that. But people still do practice. There's a lot of things that are done on matriarchal um, lines, like even if you're naming your children, you should name your child one of their middle names after your after your mother's sides, somebody in their name, into their name, so that, you know, it honors that. And people still do um, um, pass on inheritance to the um, mother's side. I have an uncle who's a chief. Um, he's a chief in Accra, and he became chief because his mother, um, his mother's line had the um, the access, so he got to be chief. He over some politics, family politics. He overshot his older brother, who should have been, but he got it. So there's some stuff about that. But um, so he, but it came from his mother's side, not from the the father's side. So that's some of the uh, history there <clears throat> around the matriarchy um, in there. And of course, you've all seen the kente cloth. Right, this is probably the typical um, one. Um, I forget the name, um, the tree name for it, but this particular pattern, um, the name says, There are no more designs. That's what that pattern means. There are no more designs. You wear that pattern for formal occasions. Right, a formal occasion, something really formal. You wear that pattern. So I've got a little bit on here. Um, so that's but there's all kinds of other patterns, right? But that's the uh, that's the. So when you see that, most of the time people say Kente Cloud, they show that, right? That's the one that they show. But there are other patterns. And I don't know if you've heard of the golden stool. Or the golden stool. So the golden stool. That's one of the reasons why Ya Santois was fighting British because they wanted the golden stool and some of the artifacts. And she said no. And they thought about it. The golden stool has significance because the, um, the 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 king, the chief, sits on the golden stool. And the history of the folklore, or the mythology, is that the first chief inherited the golden stool from the heavens. Right? It was brought down in the heavens, and people believe that it has the power in the soul of all the people of Ashanti within the golden stool. So if you sit on that, you are inheriting all the power of, there's people make up like wooden ones and things like that, but the golden one actually made of all solid gold is the, um, it's the one that the king, the chief sits on and represents um, the people. So there you go, now you have the rest of the story. <laughs> all right, so, um, the, I have a, um, a great board. Um, last year, I was talking about um, Ghana and black history and how to make connections, things like that. And um, they inspired me to put out something, and they supported to doing a legislative trip. So I've got some legislators and others and board members that will go to Ghana for a, a cultural educational trip. I know Venus wants to go, but no, yes, he can't go. Um, and uh, so I want to show this little video that uh, we've done. 
that represents the land and the um, and the people. And I'm hoping that uh, we were supposed to do it like last year, but we just didn't have time because we had stuff. But so we've kind of postponed it. But I hope that we are able to do that. And hopefully, in one next Black History Month, we'll be doing a presentation and be sharing some of our experience. So here we go. This is the. Uh <laughs> There you go. So that um, the music behind there is uh, Chanti Chui. I understand that dialect a little bit, but there's, there's some words that are in there. But basically, what uh, she's saying, she's showing the land, and she's thanking God for the trees, the food, the water, the land. And so, I thought that was quite appropriate um, musical accompaniment to share with that. So it is now 6:33. So, I'm going to say, I started with saying kwaba, welcome, in mother's tongue, so I should probably end in my mother's tongue as well, too. So, I'll say, unpenin for pacho medasi pa 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 pa, which means, thank you so very much for listening to me. That's it.